This week on ANN, the president of the Adventist Church in North America sets the date for his retirement. The Adventist Development and Relief Agency gives $2.4 million to relief in North America. And the Adventist World Radio starts the Unlocking Bible Prophecies Evangelism Series in North America. These stories and more coming up. Thank you so much for joining us this week. First in the news, President of the Adventist Church in North America, Daniel R. Jackson, and his wife Donna have announced their intent to retire, effective July 1. With the postponement of the 2020 General Conference session, the North American Division, or NAD, administration has worked with General Conference leadership to establish a clear process for the election of the new NAD president in July 2020. The Jacksons have served at the NAD headquarters since his election in June 2010 at the General Conference session in Atlanta, Georgia. He was re-elected to the position in 2015. Prior to coming to the NAD, Jackson served for eight years as the president of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Canada. Jackson says serving has always been a privilege. The real privilege of all this has been meeting with our people from coast to coast throughout the North American division in Canada, the United States, Bermuda, Guam, and Micronesia. To meet with our people, the perk of the job is to see the wonderful mission focus that many, many of our members have. This division is about mission. With the exception of five years of service in the Southern Asia division, Jackson, a native Canadian, has lived and ministered entirely in the NAD. During his career, Jackson has served the church as a pastor, teacher, and administrator. Donna Jackson has served the NAD as ministerial spouse leader and field assistant in the NAD Ministerial Association. Previously, she held the position of Family and Women's Ministries Director of the Ontario Conference of Seventh-day Adventists and the Women's Ministries Liaison Coordinator for the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Canada for eight years. In compliance with General Conference bylaws and working policy, NAD administration has worked with the General Conference leadership to establish a clear process for the election of the new NAD president. All World Division executive officers served as elected elective officers of the General Conference, and their nomination and election by the region they represent must be approved by the General Conference Executive Committee. The NAD nominating committee will meet on July 6 to select a name to be presented and voted on by the NAD Executive Committee on July 7 and sent as a recommendation to the General Conference Executive Committee. Both of these committees will be chaired by President of the Global Adventist Church, Ted N. C. Wilson. The meetings will be held virtually via Zoom and a previously used electronic voting process will be utilized. On July 9, the General Conference Executive Committee will meet virtually to receive the recommendation and elect the new NAD president. The Adventist Development and Relief Agency, or ADRA, the humanitarian arm of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, will provide food and medical supplies worth $2.4 million U.S. dollars to the North American Division's Adventist Community Services to expand relief to families and essential workers in the U.S. who are impacted and responding to the COVID-19 crisis. President of ADRA International, Michael Kruger, says, keeping families healthy and healthcare workers safe has never been more critical than now. This is why ADRA is proud to partner with the Adventist Church in the U.S. and ACS to ensure that we serve children, families, and essential workers during this health crisis. The assistance will be used in two main ways. First, for food pantries. Thousands of families across the U.S. will receive food parcels at designated Adventist Church food pantries. ADRA has committed $150,000 U.S. dollars to be allocated by ACS to regions within the North America. Most of the money, however, will be given for medical supplies. Medical supplies and personal protective equipment, or PPEs, worth $2.3 million U.S. million, will be distributed by ACS throughout North America. ADRA has been responding globally in over 70 countries, including the U.S., to help more than 2.7 million families and communities heavily impacted by the novel coronavirus health crisis. ADRA's response teams are providing a range of humanitarian assistance that varies from country to country. This includes the distribution of hand sanitizers, food kits, cash vouchers, face masks, and hygiene training. Since the COVID-19 pandemic has created unprecedented needs around the world, more than 38 million people have been left unemployed in the U.S. alone, and many food banks in the nation are seeing a rise in food shortages. ADRA continues to be on the front line providing continuous relief aid to countries worldwide. 
To help with ADRA's ongoing emergency response in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, visit adra.org slash COVID response. As the world continues to grapple with the COVID-19 pandemic and natural disasters plague countries already in distress, many people are asking some of life's big questions. Because of this, from May 31st through June 13, Cami Oatman, Vice President of Adventist World Radio, will host a worldwide masterclass focusing on Bible study and Bible prophecy. The classes will air at 7 p.m. in every time zone. Unlocking Bible prophecies will transform what may feel like a confusing book of the Bible, Revelation, into something clear and understandable. Using the Bible as the class textbook, Oatman will explore questions like, what happens after we die? How close are we to the end of time? Is it possible to have hope and peace about our future? And what is the mark of the beast? At the end of the series, organizers hope viewers will gain a deeper understanding of Jesus' love and emerge with an ever closer relationship with him. Learn more and register for this free event at awr.org slash Bible. Two medical students from Loma Linda University School of Medicine's class of 2021 created a book to help children understand why their worlds have changed dramatically in the last few months and why it's important to stay home during this time. Authors Devin Scott and Samantha Harris created the illustrated story that explores questions about the coronavirus pandemic with sisters Millie and Susie. The book, Why We Stay Home, has been downloaded more than 35,000 times since its release on April 23rd. Scott said, it's a confusing time for kids. They're home with their families. They're enjoying spending time with their siblings, but some of them don't really know what's going on. So we wanted to create a fun, short, sweet resource for parents to talk about what's going on. The aim of the book is to help children understand the coronavirus pandemic by discussing germs and concepts such as quarantine, social distancing, and how staying at home, even if you miss your friends, can help people who have a hard time fighting off germs, such as grandma and grandpa. Scott, who plans on specializing in orthopedic surgery, shared the idea with his friend and fellow medical student, Harris, who is pursuing, pursuing pediatrics. Even though they hadn't worked on a project like this before, Harris and Scott wrote the book, commissioned illustrators, and published it all within the span of two weeks. The authors are currently working on translating the book into six languages, including American Sign Language. You can find the book on millieandsusie.com. Six Adventist families in Barranquilla, North Colombia, have taken to their apartment complex balconies to play and sing hymns, read the Bible, pray, and spread hope to neighbors every night for nearly two months. Pastoral families in the apartment building, which owned by the conference, came out of their balconies at 8 p.m. every evening to pray and worship. They provided a phone number so onlookers and listeners can dial in their prayer requests. Over the weeks, the families have changed the way they share their messages and have incorporated other activities for more interaction with neighbors. It gave the sharing book, Hope in the Midst of Chaos, authored by Mark Finley, to more than 80 families in the community. During the day of the child celebrated April 25, the children of the Adventist families took over the program by reading psalms, praying, singing, and encouraging listeners with messages of hope. So far, about 40 persons have come out of their balconies or terraces to take part in the program. Even though this activity has been replicated throughout various communities in Barranquilla, President of the Church in the region, Josue Torres, invited the membership to share the message of salvation during the lockdown. Torres said, I believe that it is a wonderful testimony of trust and hope in God that we have shared with our neighbors, but I also believe that you too can share wherever you are and encourage others, letting them know that there is a God in the heavens who has the universe under his control and he defends, camps, and cares for all who call and trust in him. Coming up, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. So we sat down with Associate Director of Health Ministries, Torben Berglin, to talk about tools to thrive during this time. We'll be right back after the break. We may look, pray, read, think, worship, sing, and share differently, but we all look forward to the Sabbath, and we all look forward to the future when Jesus will come again. With this message in mind, we arrived at a core component for a new identity system, the creation grid. Regardless of what or where you are designing, you can always find information to help you communicate that we are all Seventh-day Adventists. Welcome back. Historically, the month of May is Mental Health Awareness Month. 
This year, the theme is Tools to Thrive. With the COVID-19 pandemic sweeping the globe, more and more people are battling mental health issues. We sat down with Associate Director of Health Ministries, Dr. Torben Berglund, to talk about tools people can use to cope through these difficult times. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I am happy to be joined by Dr. Torben Berglund, a psychiatrist who is going to be answering some questions for us about how to cope during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Thank you for joining us, doctor. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Well, thank you for joining us. And as you know, we are all going through this pandemic and mental health is something that is very, very crucial at this moment. And so what type of issues are you seeing people struggling with right now? Well, there's lots of reports around the world that that many people are struggling and like the obvious things are anxiety, people are worried. Uh, if people had that issue before, it probably gets worse. But like for most people, it, it's only a natural response that we sort of wonder what's 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 going to happen to me, my family, to the economy, to my workplace, these kind of things. So like there's a lot of understandable, reasonable anxiety going, going yeah. on. But I think beyond that, we see that people are, there's a lot of grief. People mm. have lost maybe loved ones. They mm. have struggling with their health. Maybe they're recovering from the COVID also, and that, that can be, be challenging. And then people losing their jobs, financial issues. So grief as a response to losing something important uh, and losing safety in a way, that's also so part of it. But then we have all the other things like depression. Uh, we have reported like probably addiction issues are going up. People are trying to cope with the stress, with the challenges. So like easy to like go into those addictions if people yeah. are prone to that. Wow, thank you so much for bringing that to light. It's so important that we all realize that. And for those of us that are that have that mental uh, tough time to understand we're not alone. Every we're all going through this um, together. Um, speaking of that, you know, in times like this, we see a lot of people encouraging us to thrive. This is your time to go out and, and do things you've never done. Uh, or or should we just be looking for tools to cope? You know, what is this balance here? Well, I, I think for, for everyone, and I, but this is like everyday challenge, like sure. to make the best of the situation. Uh, like uh, I, I found that it's, it's a bit difficult. Like what do you go out and do? Yeah. <laughs> like, go running, walking, these kind of things. But like it's a bit limited the options. Yeah. And, and like we should accept that some of those options are limited and will stay limited for a while. Uh, I think it, it, if we sort of expect that now everything is going to return to normal, next week yeah. that may in itself be a source of frustration uh, and stress in in a way so we have to stay realistic in in this situation yeah. but i think f making the best of the situation some people are going to do quite well in this situation they're not going to like me they're not maybe didn't been affected that much directly maybe they have still a stable income they have stayed well other people are more affected by the stress than certainty and anxiety and maybe they have lost more so we will have the whole range and what i also think some of to be realistic this will maybe vary from week to week and day to day so yeah. if, if i'm doing well today maybe like in a week or two or later on i will be more stressed and challenged because of things that come up so mm. i think to have a lot of slack both for ourselves and for others in this situation and yeah. be patient with one another and saying this this is a challenging situation and we will be responding differently and not always cons consistently. Now, as you know, <clears throat> in the news, we're seeing a lot of countries are getting ready to open up and, and or have been opening up and now states here in the United States are starting to open up. And as I, we are all getting ready to kind of slowly venture out of our houses, uh, what should we be thinking of in terms of our mental health? Well, I think one thing that is important is to have realistic expectations hmm. for what this is going to look like. I'm, I'm concerned that, that many think that now this thing is over. Now things are going to return to yeah. normal soon. The World Health Organization, just a few days ago, they said, we are in the middle of the first wave of this pandemic. Hmm. That's what they're saying. That is yeah. the situation we're in. But many of us, we wish we were at least over the first wave and we hope there wouldn't come a second or a third mm -hmm. wave of it. 
that's not reality yeah probably and so in that sense to be realistic and say this is going to stay with us for a while um and another thing some say that the like unhappiness it's the gap between expectations and reality mm. uh, yeah. that if we sort of create false expectations or expectations that uh like are, are just well now i'm going to everything going to return to normal the economy is going to soar through the sky yeah. all these things again like next uh, in the next weeks then we're in for a disappointment mm. uh, and again that will probably affect our 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 well-being and our ability to cope yeah there's a sense of reality that we need to to face uh, finally here uh, as we wrap up doctor what are some of these great tools that you can kind of share with us so that they can help us to thrive or even just kind of get through this this time. You know, what, what's that final thing you would like our, our viewers to know uh, as we go through this and to, uh, that those tools of encouragement? Yeah, well, I, I think to, to think holistically about this situation, both, both physically, mentally, socially, and spiritually, like how can we optimize our lives in all these dimensions? And physically, like the basic things, it's sort of, simple rules but we struggle to do them often is to eat well eat properly eat healthy uh that means so not snacking all this junk food uh <laughs> that can be easy if yeah. can, it's in the cupboard and, and maybe yeah. it's easy to go and uh, go and get it but like like if you have extra time on your hands spend that time well in preparing good food and then also to to be in physical activity every single day yeah. like our bodies are created for movement we don't yeah. do well when we become passive uh, so exercise move do gardening whatever you can that's important and then which is also very important is to sleep properly like that's what coming emerged from research the last 10 15 years is sleep is such an important part of our physical and mental well-being yeah. that means sleeping seven to nine hours a day for adults or per night for adults <laughs> but that is what what we recommend yeah but then mentally also i think it's very important to to deal with the thoughts and feelings that come up so mm -hmm. don't just run away from them but deal with and give space give time for reflection to feel what you feel and and to process them preferably yeah. together with someone talk about what you're going through and then socially stay connected yeah. with friends with family if possible even make see how how can you go even deeper in those mm -hmm. relationships and that also applies spiritually with god take time for devotion take time for prayer if you are worried if you're stressed you can come to god with all these things and, and share like your burdens and requests to 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 him so and again a holistic perspective of that where we take take care of all the dimensions essential dimensions of life yeah well thank you so so much uh dr berglund for sharing with us today uh, we truly appreciate what you're doing and, and please stay safe during this time. And for those of you watching, thank you so much and please stay safe. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Coming up, David Trim is here for this week in Adventist history. But up next, Adventist Mission shares the story of young people in Spain who are bringing people to church. Welcome back. Five years ago, an Adventist church in Spain was started by just three families. Now, thanks to the ministry of the young people, the church has grown to more than 100 people. Adventist Mission has more. On this quiet street in Madrid, Spain, you can hear the inviting sound of worship. The music is coming from this building, where the Alcala de Henares Adventist Church meets. Mm -hmm. 
Today is a special Sabbath. Some members came to church early to decorate the stage. They're preparing for a special program to celebrate and appreciate the women of this church. It's a bit hard to imagine this small space filled with a hundred people, but as the program is about to start, people come in one by one. Before you know it, the place is so full some members even have to stand at the back. Five years ago, this church started with only three families. Now around a hundred people come every Sabbath. Most of that growth is because of their young people. Ha sido un proceso. The number of young people attending grew very fast. We started with only seven young people, but we dedicated our time to youth ministries. Last year, eight members were baptized, and another six accepted Christ this year. The youth gather in this small room to study the Bible. The bond among them is evident as they sing praises together and study God's Word. We try to be united and be a big family. And of course, we're very thankful that the whole church always keeps us in their prayers. This group finds ways to meet for any occasion throughout the week, not just on Sabbath. This has helped the young people grow closer. They're not afraid to talk about their lives and share their hopes for the future, but they make sure to have fun too. They even started their own youth choir. But as much as young people are welcome in this church, it has presented them with a problem. We have a problem economic very big. We have a financial problem in the church because almost half of us are young people without income. So we don't have enough money to keep renting this place of worship. This group is praying for God's plan for their congregation. They want to keep growing, and there's no denying the importance of the youth in the church. As youth leader, Oliver is encouraged by what he sees and experiences with the young people. It warms my heart seeing all these young people come to church. Sometimes we go to church on Friday and stay as long as we can until about 11 p.m. On Sabbath, we go to church and stay there the whole day, enjoying worship together. I feel very good when I see this, and it helps me grow spiritually as well. Please pray for the Alcala de Henares Church as they continue to reach out to the young people and everyone in their community. Watch this and other mission stories online by visiting AdventistMission.org, then click on videos at the top. And finally for today's episode, let's turn to David Trim for a look at Adventist history. This week, David Tring will be looking at what Adventists were doing as World War II drew to its end 75 years ago this week. Welcome to This Week in Seventh-day Adventist History. This month, the world has been commemorating the 75th anniversary of the defeat of Nazi Germany, one of the most evil and godless regimes in human history, and the anniversary, too, of the end in Europe of World War II. And this past week in the United States, it was Memorial Day, when those who lost their lives in wars, for good or ill, are remembered. So this week in Adventist history looks at what Adventists were doing 75 years ago. Even before hostilities in Europe ended, the Seventh-day Adventist Church had begun acting to provide relief to the war-shattered continent. Fundraising began in 1944, and by 1945, two warehouses were operating at which non-perishable food, garments, and medicines were collected. This photograph shows some of the staff in one of those warehouses getting ready to ship 118 tons of relief supplies to Europe, a process they commenced this week, 75 years ago. While the war in Europe was over, many Adventist men and women too were still in uniform. The church was then still largely a North American church and many young Adventist men had been conscripted. As a result, sometimes numbers of them ended up serving in places where the local church was small 
and the increase in numbers was welcome. One such place was Iceland, where this week, 75 years ago, Ola J. Olsen, the mission superintendent, wrote to GC leaders how it had been a mutual joy to have the brave young Adventists in uniform from America. And he added, there is scarcely a Sabbath when we do not have a Sabbath school class in English. And some of them are beginning to make a small start in Icelandic too. We often hold an English meeting on Sabbath afternoons. And because many Icelanders understand English, some of them are attending these services. In Asia and the Pacific, the war against Japan went on, and there too, Adventist servicemen contributed to mission. In this photograph here, you not only see some of them, you see the fruits of their determination to witness. On May 17, 1945, the church paper, The Review and Herald, published a letter from one serviceman, Delbert Pantel, written from Numea, New Caledonia, where there was at that time no Adventist presence of any kind. But from 1942, there had been Adventist servicemen from Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. In 1943, they were organized as a branch Sabbath school by Floyd E. Bressy, the first Adventist chaplain in the United States Army. By 1945, Bressy had been transferred back to the U.S., but the 13 Adventist soldiers and sailors in New Caledonia, of whom Delbert was one, continued to meet with Delbert as their Sabbath school superintendent. He reported that not only had they collected almost $1,000 in offerings for the years, they had also advertised their church services in the island paper. And as Derek Pantel put it in his letter, this was a bold venture, for we were inviting the whole island and not a speaker among us. But moving in faith, he wrote, the Adventist servicemen put their hearts into preparation for preaching services following Sabbath school. And by the time he wrote, there were almost 40 servicemen and one indigenous woman attending services regularly, and that is who is in the photograph. The bold witness of a small group of laymen lacking any resources but their Bibles is a tremendous example of total member involvement. Thanks for watching ANN. Join us next week for more news from around the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Please remain safe and well as we face this new reality together. Remember that each of you can be pillars of hope and peace in your communities. Look for ways to help each other. Remember to continually pray for each other, look out for each other, and lift each other up. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Adventist News and on Facebook.com slash Adventist News. You can reach us at annvideo11 at gmail.com. Before we say goodbye, here's some good news from the book of 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 24. The passage says, He himself bore our sins in his body on that tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. That's our program for this week. And remember, you can always visit news.avenist.org for daily news and videos. Until next time, God bless. Take care. <laughs>